Good morning, everybody. Great to see you this morning. Look forward to our time discussing God's Word. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount in this Sunday morning class. And we're still in chapter 5. I, I think you quickly remember that the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's account, that's the one we're following through. In Matthew 5, chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. We're still in chapter 5. Uh, but there's just so much information here, powerful instruction about how we should be living our lives and doing our work. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 is where we pick up our reading this morning. Let's read 38 through 42. Matthew 5, 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn, thou, turn not thou away. All right, so remember that this whole section here, several different paragraphs begin with a similar statement. Ye have heard, or it has been said. Uh, and so it seems clearly that Jesus is talking about how the Pharisees had been applying God's law uh, under the law of Moses, which was faulty. It was definitely faulty. But Jesus is actually instructing us to go to even a higher plane than what was instructed under the law of Moses. And so it is both a condemnation of the Pharisees very perverted application of the law of Moses, but it's also instruction about kingdom matters and, and the standard that Jesus expects us to live to in his kingdom. So the Pharisees had a rule, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, that's not necessarily a misstatement of what the law of Moses said, but their application, well, let's go back to Deuteronomy 19. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, we recently studied this when we were talking about the problem of bearing false witness. In Deuteronomy 19, beginning verse 16, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the man, or excuse me, both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition, and behold, if the witness be a false witness, and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall you do unto him as he had thought to, to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. Notice, and those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And the eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Well, there's the statement, right, in verse 21. But understand the context in which that statement was made. The context is of a judicial setting. They were going before the judges. Uh, and, and he dealt initially with the possibility that somebody could be lying about, about you, you know. They could be saying, he did this, when in fact you had not done this. And, and so, as we talked about recently, there, there, uh, bearing false witness was a, a, a bad crime, and, and this is dealing with that. But then it, it says, but if you've gone through the process and you find out that the witness is true, and that a man has committed offense, then the punishment measured to him should be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. But remember, this is in a judicial setting. This is what the judges would put upon the guilty party, right? The Pharisees had used that statement to justify their personal vengeance. And, and so that's what Jesus is, is addressing here. Not, not that the law didn't say that. The law did say that. But it was not to be administered on a personal basis. It was to be administered by the judges, they would make inquisition, they would inquire, they would determine the truth. And in a case where offense had happened, the punishment would be measured out in that fashion. But that's totally different than the idea of 
personal vengeance. You, you harmed me, I'm going to harm you back in like fashion or more. And that seems to be the way that the Pharisees were applying that. Monty. A real clear statement of the penalty for taking a life, for instance, was stated to, Mo, or stated to Noah after the flood in Genesis 9, verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And so that's always been a rule. But as Monty said, the problem is that it was never an authorized thing for me to take personal vengeance against someone who had, had wronged me. Um, and, and the passage we've got to tie into this from Romans chapter 12. Notice Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So, we never, and, and, and it's always been the case, it's, as, as my pointed out, it's always been the case that personal vengeance was never licensed by God, never authorized by God. Um, and the Pharisees were trying to, to use this statement in that way, and they were wrong about that, and we were wrong about that. You know, that's one of the expressions from the Bible that's pretty familiarly recognized, even in our day and time, even by people who are not Bible students. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I mean, everybody has heard that expression. Uh, and, and most people would apply it in the sense of personal vengeance. You knock my tooth out, I'm gonna knock your tooth out. And it was never intended that way. Uh, and so th that's the main thing that we've got to remember. The, the Pharisees had misapplied it, and we'd be misapplying it if we suggested that we could use that to justify personal vengeance. Now, I think it's also, go back there to Deuteronomy 19 again. I think one of the, one of the things that we have to comment about, when justice is properly administered, not personal vengeance, but when, when those in, in proper positions to administer punishment for wrongdoing... Notice what happens. Deuteronomy 19, verse 20. Those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. In other words, when, when evil is properly punished, not by us personally, but by those who, to whom it is their responsibility to administer justice, other people learn from that and they fear and they, and, and they won't commit such offenses. I'm sure you agree with me that one of the huge breakdowns in our culture is that wrongdoers are not punished, certainly not punished in a timely manner. Uh, and, and, and so evil prospers, evil grows, evil becomes worse and worse because it's not being properly addressed. But it's not my job. So, so, this, so this guy's a bad, he's a bad, really bad actor. And so I'm going to sort of take vigilante action against him. Maybe he hasn't even wronged me personally, but he's wronged others. He's a bad, bad guy, and I'm going to take it upon myself. The courts are not acting, certainly not acting promptly. I'm going to take it on myself to punish that guy. That's not my job, right? And so in all matters, there are people who are, who are authorized to punish evil. They should be doing their job, and when they don't, uh, then I think they'll be accountable for that. But it's never my prerogative to go out here and, and act independently in seeking vengeance or punishing evil. Thoughts or comments along that line? 
Um, so what, what principle is, and he asked us question three there in that section. We're on this section in your study guide under attitudes toward enemies. Uh, what, what is the main thing that Jesus is teaching here? He asked us question three, uh, concentrating on these, uh, on these verses, what principle or principles is Jesus trying to teach? I would say that what Jesus is trying to teach is the idea that we just read there in Romans 12, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Um, I, I think that's the principle Jesus is setting forth. Do what you can, go, go the extra mile. Go further than you think might even be reasonably expected of you to maintain peace with others. But you gotta remember that statement of Paul over there in Romans 12, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes it's, I mean, you can do everything. You can go the extra mile. And there's some people who just will not be peaceable with you. So that's not, that's not on you, right? As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And I really believe that's the concept that Jesus is setting forth here. Go to the extreme. Go farther than you think you should have to go in order to try to maintain peace. Uh, Josh. I think the very first part of verse 39 says, What he did really makes me mad, and I just like to just bust him in the mouth. I can't do that, right? Uh, so uh, we've, got, we've got to go above and beyond, farther than you think you should necessarily have to go in order to have peace, if it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible. As much as life in you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes it's not possible, because the other guy, no matter what you do, is not going to be peaceable. Uh, Dale? <laughs> The eternal vengeance of God against evildoers. But, you know, uh, look at Romans. We were looking at Romans 12, the last verse of Romans 12. But look at, look at as, that, as that context goes on into Romans 13. Uh, Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to them damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then be afraid of the power? Wilt thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So as Dale suggested, God, God will take eternal vengeance on evildoers, but he also has appointed, in this case, Paul's talking about civil government. Civil government is his agent as a revenger. It's not my job, but God has appointed civil government to do the job of being an avenger against evildoers. So certainly as Dale said, in eternity, God's vengeance will be against the evil, but even here on earth, he's appointed some avenues to take vengeance upon evildoers uh, and, and those in those positions need to be doing their job, which many times they are not. All right, now I got a question for you. Verse 39 is a verse that comes up very frequently in the discussion about self-defense. Can we defend ourselves against someone who is attacking us? Um, and I know that you're uh, aware of some who take what, for better, want of a better term, would be a pacifist view, that you cannot defend yourself, that you can never. I mean, if somebody is attacking you or attacking your family, attacking your loved ones, you just, you just can't resist at all. It says, resist not evil. Uh, I, I've even, sadly, I've even heard, I, I knew of a preacher once who took the position that if a, if a man broke into his house and was, was attacking his wife, uh, could he defend, could he, could he fight him off, defend his wife against a, a sexual assault? And he said, no, 
I couldn't do it. And, and then they said, well, what would you do? And then he, he, he referred to the later verses in this chapter uh, uh, where it says, verse 44, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute. So he said, I would just have to pray for him. Is that the right application of this statement in verse 39? Resist not evil. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Monty? I think that's exactly right. So verse 39, what is the, what is the assault under question? It's a slap in the face, right? Well, a slap is not going to do injury or harm. This was, as Monty said, this was a taunt. This was an effort to get you to be angry, to try to make you engage in anger. In fact, I, I knew a preacher once that made this explanation. I think it's kind of interesting. Think about this. Notice it's specified, whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So, so most people are right-handed, right? So I'll use Joel as an example. This is Joel's right cheek. If I'm going to slap him on the right cheek, how do I do that? I, I can't hit him with an open hand because if I hit him with an open hand, I'd be hitting him on his left cheek. To smite him on the right cheek, I'd have to be hitting him like that to hit him on the right cheek, right? Now think about that. I'm not going to cause any real harm that way. That's an insult. That's a taunt. That's a provocation. I'm just trying to get him to escalate this to the next level, right? So what do I do? If that is the, and that seems to me clearly to be the, the scenario that Jesus is describing here. What do I do with that? Well, he's not, he's not hurting me. He's trying to provoke me. Turn to the other cheek. I don't have to fight him. I don't, I don't have to be led into a fight. Now, do most people react that way? No, right? Most people will, will come, come right back at you violently if you slap them in the face. Jesus is calling us to a high level here. I mean, I'm going to tell you, that's not easy, right? Somebody insults you by slapping you in the face. It's hard to turn the other cheek. I'm not denying that at all. That's a high standard that Jesus is asking us to live up to. But that's what we've been reading all through this section, right? A high standard of personal conduct that Jesus has. So you've been provoked. What do you do? Turn away. Turn the other cheek. You know, you know, that's another expression that's commonly known by people who are not even Bible students, right? Turn the other cheek. So you turn the other cheek. He's just insulting you. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to do you permanent bodily harm. Turn the other cheek. Now, we're not going to dive off into a whole discussion of self-defense here, which I think is an important and interesting discussion. I just want to make the point that I don't think this verse argues against the possibility that we can defend ourselves against real, harmful, violent assault. Because that's not what this context is talking about. So we can talk about self-defense another time, but I just want to make the point that I don't think this passage... Uh, is applicable in the question of can you defend yourself against an attacker? Against an attacker who really intends to harm you or kill you or your loved ones for that matter. Or any, I don't think this passage applies to that discussion. Dale?
He pulled a gun and killed you, or you pulled a gun and killed him. A lot of like that would be, you know, like we said, in defense. Uh, it's, you start out this calm. We had a chance to let it go. Could have walked away from it and should have. Yeah. All right. All right. So. Again, I think the principles Jesus is setting forth in these verses that we're looking at is go the extra mile. In fact, he even, where did that expression go the extra mile come from? Well, it, they very well have come from verse 41. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. There apparently, there was this rule of, uh, of course, the Jews were under the control of the Roman government and the Romans were pretty hard to deal with and, and they were authoritarian and they really put it on people. And so apparently the rule was that if a Roman soldier came up to you, he could, he could require you to carry his gear for a mile. Uh, and, and the Jews hated that. I mean, they hate it. I think we would hate that if we were under the control of, a, uh, uh, of an occupying army and, and one of the mean old soldiers said, pick up that gear and carry it. That'd be an aggravating thing. That would just, and the, Jew, uh, the Jews were just constantly under that agitation of the Romans. And so they would like, what would be your, what would be your reaction to that? Fight back. You know, I'm not doing that. I'm fighting back against that rascal. No. If he compels you to go a mile, go too. Go the extra mile. That's got to be where that comes from, right? And that's the idea. That's exactly the idea. We understand that figure of speech. Go the extra mile. Do, go beyond what you think would be necessary in order to sustain peace. Josh? One thing we're going to have to realize as Christians, too, is just like Dale said earlier, this aggressive that he's talking about, this evil person he's talking about, it's going to be judged, even if it's not judged justly by the judicial system, it's going to be judged justly by God later on. But as a Christian, we have to remember that how we react in this situation, we're going to be judged by as well. We're going to have to answer for how we react in these uh, provocations that, that people do to us in our lives. Exactly right. Uh, what about verse 40? We kind of skipped over 40 there real quickly. Go back to 40. If a man sues thee at law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Should I not engage in, in other words, I've been sued. I've been taken to court. I've been taken before the authorities. Uh, should, I not, should I not resist? In other words, would it be wrong in applying this verse, would it be wrong if I got sued? And I thought it was an unjust lawsuit. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, th this guy is suing me for everything I own and more over something that's not even legitimate. I didn't do it. I'm not at fault, but, but I can't resist. And so I just so he sues me, and I got to give him everything I have because that's what he's asking for. I can't resist that at all. Would that be the application of this verse, Monty? Another thing Jesus talks about settling with someone on the way. If you're being sued, settle with him before you get to court. So I think what he's saying here, if you can settle this before you get to court, if he's suing you for your coat, give him your cloak to it, that'll settle it before he gets to court, before things get way out of hand. Yeah. So I think that's just being consistent here. If that's what it takes for us to get along, if you think I owe you my coat, I'll give you the cloak to it, if, if that'll make peace between us. I think you're exactly right. Again, honor the context here. Remember the context. The context is go the extra mile, do everything in your power to be at peace. It may not be possible because the other guy may not cooperate, but you go way above what you thought was reasonable or expected in order to avoid conflict. And so I don't think this is saying you could never defend yourself against a lawsuit. This, what it is saying is, as Monty said, just try to stop that before it even gets that far. Try, I mean, if, if, if he's suing you for your coat, say, hey, I'll settle with you. That's okay. That's, if you want my coat here, take my cloak also. The, the, it, wa it was just an effort to avoid conflict as much as you can. But remember, it's not always just up to you, right? 
Uh, and then the, 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 the last verse in this section that we haven't really discussed. What about 42? Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Uh, okay. Okay, Matt, I want $10,000. Hand it over today. You can't say no. You can't say no because this said, to him that asketh thee, uh, give to him that asketh thee, from him that would borrow thee, turn not away. You have no choice in the matter. I'm demanding it, and you must give it. Is that the right understanding of it? Could, could society function under a literal application of that verse? It couldn't, could it? I mean, that'd be crazy. Because anybody that asked me for whatever I had, money or things or whatever, I just got to turn it over. Well, if that, if that rule was literally applied... We'd be, I'd tell you, we'd be in total chaos, just absolute chaos. That's not what's, that, remember the context. The context of this is avoid conflict as much as possible. Uh, and, and so this is just another illustration of that concept, avoid conflict. If, if this guy wants to borrow, uh, it, it, but even a borrower, should I give to everybody who wants to borrow from me? Uh, I, I, there, are, there are other biblical principles that apply, right? Uh, for instance, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 says, Even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Wait a minute. Here's a guy who won't work, but he's asking me for what I've got. He's saying, give me everything in your refrigerator. Give me everything. I want everything in your refrigerator. Do I have to give it to him? Well, if I did, very likely I'd be violating the command of, verse, of 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, that if the guy won't work, neither should he eat. So, again, I think when, when we take it all into consideration, that statement also has to be understood in this context of do what you can to avoid conflict with others. If possible, be at peace with all men. Because really, that's, that's better, right? Being at peace with all men is a better thing than being at conflict with other men. And so, they're better off, I'm better off, my influence is better, my opportunity to teach and influence them is improved if I work hard to maintain peace. But none of these statements, not a single one of these statements, can or should be applied in absolute literal sense. Uh, so, I mean, just, just take it at that. And by the way, I would just say, because the verse that, that, that I think is the greatest point of controversy here is verse 39. Oh, the pacifist says, you can't defend yourself against assault. Well, I'll tell you, be careful how you apply that verse, because if you apply that verse that way, then you're also going to have to apply the rest of the verses in this section, literally and completely. And so that means if someone sues you, you've got to give them whatever they ask for. You can't hold back. Uh, if, if someone wants to borrow from you, you can't say no. You have to give them whatever they ask. But what's interesting is that the people who want to use verse 39 to support the pacifist view would not make that application of the subsequent verses that are all in the same context. See what I'm saying? Dale. I'm grateful back to what you said earlier. So if somebody comes crashing in your house and they had a gun and it's cheap and it's trading and it's wiped out, that would be a totally different situation because you wouldn't have a chance to be at peace with that guy. You don't even have the chance to be at peace with that guy. Right. You're under siege at that moment. Yeah. I think that would be a totally different I think you're right. I think you're right. Joe. Sure. So he yeah. maybe not maybe a selfless act, not not putting you higher than himself, 
He says, yeah, I'll sacrifice that money I saved for that dinner. I'm going to help you make your gold bill or whatever. So I think we just can't totally let ourselves off the hook. No, we can't let ourselves off the hook on any of these principles. But you can't apply them unconditionally and, and, and completely literally, or we would be in chaos. And so all of, this is, all of these would involve a judgment. So this guy's asking me to borrow or asking me to give. Notice it starts out in verse 4, to give to him that asketh thee. He's asking me to give him something. Well, I know i got to make a determination. Is he worthy of being helped? Or is he just so lazy he won't work, neither should he eat? So I got to make it, there's a judgment in that, involved in that. Uh, I should be sacrificial. I should, I, should, I should do more than would be reasonably expected of me in giving to those who are in need. But I still got to make a judgment as to whether it's an, a, a, a justifiable situation. All right. So that's a, that's a really powerful section. Would you agree? That's really a powerful situation. Now, think about it this way. If I am living by this principle, a man slapped thee on the right cheek, turned him the other cheek also. I'm living by this principle. And the other guy is living by that principle too. What's the outcome? Man, we have perfect peace, right? There, there's no conflict. You couldn't make conflict between two people who are, deli- who are determined to live by that rule, right? So in, in, in this section, if everybody would just do that, we, we'd be conflict-free. Sadly, lots of people won't live by those rules, but we're still obligated to do so. As much as life and be at peace with all men. Matt? I think a good example of this and some other things, I've never, I've never seen it done in a, in a church. This happened before I, I went to the congregation, but uh, there were two brothers in conflict with one another they were going to go to, to court over land disputes and how we can do that. We're going to settle it among the, the church so they both agreed to, to do that rather than going to brother with court with brother. And uh, the church found in this one man's favor that the land was his. He had right to deed to it. Everything was legit and there shouldn't be any dispute. It should be be settled as as it was, and uh, but they didn't suit one of the brothers. The other guy didn't, didn't accept that. He kept on pushing, so the man just gave him that part of the land, deeded it over to him. Yeah. And I think that's a good example of this right here to keep peace. He went he beyond, went above beyond. Him. Yeah, exactly. Right. Dale. Well, it would be at least, at least you'd have a chance to, that, that would, you'd come a lot closer to resolving the situation than if you turned right around and punched him in the nose. I would just summarize this. This immediate paragraph is about avoiding conflict as much as possible. But back, I want to go touch one more time on what Joel said. I don't think we should take verse 42 and our understanding of verse 42 in this context to mitigate at all against our need to be a benevolent people. There's plenty else said uh, all through the scripture about being benevolent, being kind, being considerate of those who are poor and in need. That's, there's lots said. Uh, and so I wouldn't want to, anything that we're saying here, as Joel was pointing out, nothing we should say, are saying here would, 
would argue against the importance of being a benevolent people. I think we need to be. I think we need to be more. I think we, we, we need to look for opportunities to be benevolent. We're well blessed. But that's not, this verse is, I would not use this verse to, or our understanding of this verse to say, you don't have to give to anybody. Don't worry about giving to anybody. There's plenty else taught in the scriptures about that. But this is talking, this immediate paragraph is about do everything in your power to avoid conflict. All right. Okay. Let's look, uh, let's look on, let's read to the end of the chapter. Dale, do you have another thought? So what you're saying is we got to make a judgment call in, in all matters of benevolence. And, and, uh, and I, I, I think that's certainly true. But we should, if, I, I, I think our rule, and I think the context of these verses would suggest if we're going to error, error on the side of generosity rather than selfish or stinginess. Right? So it's a tough thing. It's definitely a tough thing. No doubt about it. Dale? Yeah, you don't want you don't want to you don't want to enable their sin. I think you're right. All right, let's read to the end of the chapter. We won't have time to discuss all this. Uh, we're just about out of time, but read to the end of the chapter, here, beginning at verse 43. Ye have heard. There's that introduction again, right? Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. All right. So the Pharisees' rule and principle was love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Love, in other words, be selective here. I got some people that I really like. Uh, I count them as good friends. Uh, th th they are my neighbors and I'm, I, I love them. But man, there's, there's, a, there's a list of people that I consider to be enemies and I hate them. And I feel fully justified in that. I'm to love my neighbor as myself, but I can hate my enemy. And I do, and I hate him with a deep purple passion. And that's what I'm going to do. So that was their application. And they thought they were doing pretty well in that. You know, love, the, love your enemies. I mean, uh, love your neighbor rather. Love your neighbor. I love my neighbor. But... On the other hand, I feel justified in hating my enemies. That's the way the Pharisees were going about their work. So what's the standard of Jesus in this matter? That was a wrong application by the Pharisees anyway, right? We understand that. But here's Jesus again calling us way up high on the mountain, very high level. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I don't know about you, but I'm personally thinking that this may be the hardest thing that we've read about so far, right? This may be one of the harder instructions in all of the New Testament. This may be one of the harder, if not the hardest instructions that Jesus gives in, in all of his teaching. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Okay. All right. So I got this guy. He's my enemy. I'm just going to avoid him. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, I'm just not going to, I'm going to write him off. He's dead to me. He's dead to me. I'm just going to write him off. That's what Jesus said here. He said that I'm supposed to do good to him. He hates me. I know that. He's made it clear that he hates me. But I'm going to try to do good to him. And I'm certainly going to pray for him. Even a, even a guy who would engage in persecution against me, I'm going to try to do good. I'm going to pray for him. 
I'm going to love him. And, and love here is not in the sense that we're going to be bosom buddies. You know, we're best friends. You know. He won't even let, he's my enemy. He, he, ha, he, he has professed that he hates me. So it's not going to be like, you know, best buds. That's not going to be the case. But that's not what, that's not what the highest form of love is, right? The highest form of love is actually a sacrificial love. I'm, I'm going to seek his well-being. Uh, that's what this love is about. I'm going to seek his well-being. And I'm going to try to do good relative to him. And I'm certainly going to pray for him. That's all hard. That's really hard. That's hard stuff to do. You know, uh, now, I don't think the application of the verse is that I just wash it all away, act like nothing bad ever happened. He never sinned against me. He's never done me wrong. It's not saying that. This is still in that context of do more than would be reasonably expected of you. And, and what's reasonably expected of you is you love those who love you and you hate those who hate you. But Jesus is calling us to that high level, which he says, try to do good for them. Uh, pray for them. Uh, bless them. Be, be a blessing to them if you can, as much as you can. And notice that he says, if you do that and if you live by that rule, you will be the children of the Father which is in heaven. For he makes his rain, the sun to shine on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the just. What's that? Verse 45, you may be the children of your father. You know what that means? We have an expression. Like father, like son. Like father, like son. So if you, if you love your enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you, it will be like father, like son. You will be like the father. Because what does the father do? Well, he makes the, the, the sun to rise on the evil. And just, here's this guy. He's the worst guy you ever imagined. He's the most wicked, evil, na nasty person that you ever thought of. God still makes the sun shine on him. God still sends rain over his house. God does good to those who hate him. God blesses those um, who are his professed enemies. So if I do then I'm like the father. It's like father, like son, if I do that. God does that. Now, does God do that unconditionally? Does God's, uh, God's, oh, here's this guy who hates God, who blasphemes God, who speaks against God. Does God continue to bless him unconditionally in all ways? No, all right, there, there's limitations. God, God's goodness is, is limited by his justice, right? And so even in the case of God, he doesn't just blanket overlook all the evil that a person does. But he does do all that he can. God does all that he can to bring that man back to him. And this is what, this is what Jesus is asking us to do. Do all you can to make that enemy not an enemy anymore. All right? He hates you. Do all you can to change that attitude in his heart towards you. It may not be possible. God, doesn't, God certainly doesn't turn everyone to him. God blesses the evil, not unconditionally, not limitless, but God does what he can to bring his enemies to him. And that's what we need to do. Dale. I think you're right. I think you're right. There's more to say about that. Again, I think these verses are some of the hardest of all in the Sermon on the Mount to apply. But boy, if we did, what a wonderful world it would be. All right, we'll talk more about that next week, Lord willing.